have your Bibles this morning, open them to the book of Ruth, Uh, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Now the book of Ruth will be right before 1 Samuel, back on your left side of Psalms, keep going to your left, if you come to 1 Samuel and start slowing down and get to uh, the book of Ruth, just four chapters. And the, right before the book of 1 Samuel, right after the book of Judges. The book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Most of you, every you, all of you Christian girls and ladies here ought to be familiar with the book of Ruth. A great, uh, great book that it is. And we're going to be speaking to you just for a few minutes this morning on a thought that's always been a blessing to me ever since I first uh, learned about it and heard about it. And uh, we hope that God will speak to your heart through it. We'd, act, we'd like to ask you undivided attention just for a few minutes this morning that those around you may hear and that people may be saved. If you're here this morning and you say, well, I don't have to be a Christian, you know, i got my own life to live, I say amen to that. You sure do. And you got it. There's not a person in this room that don't have a life to live and you can make the decisions on which way you want to live it. And God's not going to make you do anything. Young people, moms and dads, and boys and girls, we've all got a life to live. And we've got to make a decision which way we want to live it. And uh, I can tell you one thing, though. I've been out there, and I've been in here. And I've been on both sides of the fence, and I found out it's a whole lot better on the inside. So you pray this morning as we'd speak to you by the help of the Lord in the book of Ruth, chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. The book of Ruth, chapter 4, begin reading with verse number 1. We'd ask that you pray for us this morning. The Lord might help us to say just what He'd have us to say. And if you're here and not saved... You can be saved before this service is over. If you're a Christian, I hope something will be said that will help you. Verse 1, Then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, 
Naomi that is come again out of the country of Moab selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it, for thou, buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee. And I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of, the, of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things. A man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Melon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, the Ruth, more Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Melon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. We'd like for you to keep your Bibles open there just for a moment, a few minutes, and we'd like to speak to you on the subject, our kinsman redeemer. Our kinsman redeemer. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank You, Lord, for this privilege and opportunity that we have once again to bow on our knees and call You our Father. We're thankful, Lord, that You've given us grace and mercy. We're thankful, Father, that You loved us and You washed us from our sins in Your own blood. And God, we're thankful tonight or this morning, Lord, that You've given us the privilege to come back to church on a Sunday morning. And God, You've given us a good Sunday school. And Lord, You've blessed us with a place to worship You. And Lord, we're ever grateful for that. We thank You, God, for what You've done for us. God, I pray as we'd look into Your Word this morning that You would calm or settle anything, God, that would be contrary. Help us to think the thoughts You'd have us to say and put them into words. And Lord, give us that special anointing that we need to declare Your Word with fear, without fear and without favor, without partiality, without compromise. God, I pray that we'd do it. God, I thank You, Lord, for what You've already done. Now we pray, Lord, that You'd move in in mighty power. Do a great and mighty work this morning, God. Do what needs to be done in this service. Do what needs that man cannot do. May lives be changed, Father, for the glory of God. And whatever's accomplished, we'll praise You and thank You for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I'd like for you to keep your Bibles open just for a few minutes this morning. And the book of Ruth, chapter 4. And we'll be talking about the kinsman redeemer. Now, the book of Ruth is a beautiful book. It's full of grace and truth. And the, the name Ruth itself would mean friendship or beauty. And in this book of Ruth, we find one of the most amazing stories anywhere in the Word of God. Now, if a person comes up to you and they tell you, I don't believe the Bible, and they say, I just don't know if it's true or not, then that person is showing that they've never spent much time in the Bible. Because a person that's honest and with an open mind cannot read through that Old Testament if he knows what happened in the New Testament and keep from knowing that there had to be some kind of supernatural power behind the writing of the Word of God. And this morning we'd like to look, give you just one of those stories. As you that know, have heard me talk about the Old Testament, know that I always like to say that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. There are many things that were hidden and shadowed in the Old Testament that were brought out into the light in the New Testament and made plain. And when you stop to think about the fact that the New Testament was written hundreds of years before the Old Testament, and you start thinking, how did it all wind up in there and just come together just like a sweater knit together, and all of the Bible make one perfect whole, then you realize that God had to have His hand on the writing of this book. But in this story this morning, we find one of the most beautiful pictures of Jesus Christ redeeming us and saving us to be a part of His bride of anywhere in the Word of God. Now, if you're not familiar with the book of Ruth, Ruth, right quick, it started maybe back in the days of the Judges, and the Judges, the book uh, just before it. It started back there when they had a famine in the land. 
And during the time of the people of the Lord, they had a great famine in the land. There was nothing to eat. You couldn't get your hands on food. And many people, the money was no good. And the people didn't have things to eat. And many people started going elsewhere. And you'll find that in the story in the book of Judges chapter 6. But anyway, there was a certain man of uh, uh, this, the Lord's town, Judah and Bethlehem, that decided that he would go off to another country and make him a living. This man's name was Elimelech. And he decided to go to Moab and sojourn for a while. He and his wife Naomi and his two sons. Well, it wasn't long after he got there that his two sons got married. One of them married a girl named Orpha, and the other married a girl named Ruth. And it came to pass that, first thing you know, Elimelech died. And the next thing you know, his two sons died. And that left his wife Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, Orpha and Ruth. And it left him down there in a strange country which Naomi wasn't brought up in. But Ruth and Orpah was brought up in Moab and were familiar with the customs and all. And Ruth, I mean, Naomi said the best thing for me to do is go back home. I found out that the famine's over with and everybody's got enough to eat back home. And so <clears throat> I want to just go back home and get me something to eat. And I'm moving back home. My husband's dead. My two sons are dead. And the best thing I can do is just go back home. And so she loaded up and said, I'm leaving and going back home. And she said to her two daughter-in-laws, Now you two girls stay here, and first thing you know, you'll find you another husband and get married. And they didn't want to, and Orpha decided to but Ruth said, No, I'm going with you. And Ruth named itself meaning friendship. Till her told her mother-in-law Naomi, she made those great statements that the songs have been written from, Whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. You know what that ought to be? Every person in this room's testimony this morning. They say, Lord, wherever you want me to go, that's where I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do. Whatever you want me to say, that's what I'll say. And Ruth had just this kind of dedication. But anyway, the story goes on that she went back home. And Naomi said, I believe you better stay here because I ain't got no more sons. And if I did have one, it'd be 15, 20 years before they got big enough for you girls to marry. And you might as well just stay here and find you another husband. And Ruth said, no, I love you so much that I'm going back with you. So they made their journey back into the country of Moab, or out of Moab, back into Bethlehem, Judah. <coughs> and in this story, we find that uh, they got over here and they got back to their hometown. And then we see how the story of the kinsman would come in. The Bible teaches us about a kinsman redeemer. Now in those days, laws were different than what they are now. If a person had a wife and she died, or he died, then his brother was supposed to take that woman and marry her and raise up seed to his brother so that his name wouldn't be cut off and his name keep the family name of going. It's not like it is now. But anyway, this uh, uh, story, she comes back to her hometown. Ruth and her mother come back home, or her mother-in-law come back home, and to this town of Bethlehem, Judah. And the Bible teaches us that they come back and Ruth got dedicated. And she worked in the field and done all of these jobs that needed to be done. Now, if you'll watch just closely for a minute this morning, you'll see how that something's begin to happen here in the Bible to show us a great truth. And so they came back there and the Bible said that there was a certain man named Boaz, which was akin to them, but there was one certain kin, kinsman that was closer kin to them than he was. So really by right, this man should have got to marry Ruth and not Boaz. He had first shot at it or first claim. Now you that understand your Bible and types know that in this story, Ruth is a beautiful picture or type of the church. And Boaz would be a beautiful picture or type of Jesus Christ getting His bride and purchasing her to be His wife. Now, brother, that's how come we preach, teach these kids things like they were saying a while ago. It's because if you're saved, you are part of the bride of Jesus Christ. The, the church is His body, and the church is His bride. And brother, if you're part of God's bride, and if you're part of the bride of Jesus, that He don't want you running around on some, with somebody else. He don't want you flirting with the devil. Because He loves you. And there ain't a man here in this building that loves his wife that cares if she runs around on him. And that don't care if she runs around on him. 
And anyway, brother, you're part of the bride of Christ. I'm part of the bread of blood, uh, the bride and body of Christ because we've been redeemed by His blood, and He has redeemed us. The Bible said we've been not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so we're going to look at the story of the kinsman this morning, right quick. Over in the book of Leviticus, excuse me. Over in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, the Bible tells us the story of a kinsman redeemer. If a brother was poor and sold himself, then any of his near kin could redeem him or buy him back. And redeem would mean the one who pays and the free by paying. And if he was able, a man could redeem his self. Now you and I know this morning that none of us were able to redeem our self. There's nobody that can save their self. There's nobody that can be good enough to go to heaven. I'm going to say something this morning that may even shock some of you people in this church. Did you know this morning that there is not a person in this church that's good enough to go to heaven? Not a one, brother. And we have been redeemed. We've been made worthy by His blood that He shed for us on the cross. But without that blood, and if God took His hand off me, I'd be just mean as a devil. And if God took His hand off you, you'd be mean as a devil. Have you ever had somebody that they got in church and they lived pretty good for a while, but it wasn't long, they was right back out and seeing What happened? That's showing you that a person cannot live the Christian life without God living inside their heart. And brother, you see other people that's been serving God for 40 years and still going strong. What's the secret? What's the difference? No man can live a Christian life until Jesus is in his heart. And as a lot of people these days, they think, well, I'll go to church and I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to start doing good. And I'm going to straighten up, quit cussing, drinking and everything. And I'm going to really do good. And they don't last two weeks till they're right back out there in the same mess because they're trying to do it on their own. Nobody can save their self, brother. If God took His hand off of me, I'd be just as mean as I ever was and probably a whole lot meaner. But anyway, a man can't redeem himself. But anyway, the Bible says that over in the book of Leviticus 25, back in the Old Testament, you'll find how that God made a law for a kinsman to redeem somebody that had been sold. And so, this woman here had been, uh, needed to be redeemed. And she needed a husband. See how Boaz was a type of Christ and Ruth a type of the church. The first thing he done was he went up to intercede for Ruth. He went up there to make intercession for her. He fell, after he fell in love with her and they decided to get married, he said, Ruth, there's one more kinsman closer to you than I am. And if he decides he wants you, he gets first pick at you. But he said, I hope I get you. And she said, Boaz, I hope you get me too. Because you're the one that I'm in love with. And so he went up there. He went down to the elders of the city. And he gathered all the men in there to make intercession for Ruth. You know, that's what Jesus is doing this morning. He sits at the right hand of God. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. I want to tell you something, friend. If it was not for Jesus Christ and His shed blood and His sacrifice that was shed on the cross, holding back God, God would kick every one of us in hell. And we deserve to be there this morning. There's not a person in this church what can lift their hand and say, I'm good. I don't deserve to burn. Oh, yes, you do. You broke God's Ten Commandments. Every last one of them, and I have to. You said, I ain't never murdered nobody. The Bible said, if you hate somebody, you're a murderer. You said, I ain't never committed adultery. The Bible said, if you look with your eye, you're committing adultery. People in this church have broke every commandment God ever made. Brother, if we got what we deserve, we'd go to hell, every one of us. And I'm glad to say to you this morning, whether you like it, lump it, spit it out, choke on it, whatever you want to do, I'm glad to tell you that there's only one way through the pearly gate. It is the old crossroad and the way called straight. And until a person comes to the place where they realize they can't save their self and they're lost and they can't do it by their self, God can't do nothing for that person. Did you know God never does do something for a person they realize they can't do it theirself? Right. There's probably some of you in here, you've been trying to live a Christian life for no telling how long. You ain't never done nothing with it yet. You know what you need to do? Give up and let Jesus take over. And anyway, right, right quickly, He went on up there to make intercession for us. Now, I'll give you a little jewel that the Lord gave me. I want you to know, brother, there was one kinsman that was closer than Boaz was. There was one kinsman. Now, if you let your mind think just for a minute, the Bible said the law 
came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so Boaz would represent Jesus Christ and the grace of God. And friend, you'll never be able to understand Christianity until you get in your mind what grace is. Brother, it's all of grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. You cannot make heads or tails out of the Bible if you understand the doctrine of grace. And the reason nobody hardly can't understand the Bible these days, and they think the Bible is a book of, of uh, some old mean tyrant up in the sky condemning everybody and going to kill everybody, going to put everybody in hell, they don't understand the doctrine of grace. But anyway, before grace got a hold of her, before Boaz could get Ruth, there was one kinsman that was closer kin than he was that had first shot. And if this kinsman wanted her, he would have been able to get her. Now, what would this kinsman represent? I guarantee you, brother, that you'll find if you study the Word of God that this closer kinsman would represent a type of the law. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people have got that backwards these days. They think that the way a person is saved is by keeping a law. And that, you know, some people say, well, I'm going to heaven, I live by the Ten Commandments. I do this, I help out my neighbor, I don't kill, I don't steal, I don't do this and that, and therefore I must be going to heaven. No, you got it completely backwards. That hasn't the slightest thing to do with it. You're not saved by what you do or what you don't do. You're saved not by your works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us and washing of, by the regeneration of the Holy Ghost. But anyway, Boaz talks to him. He goes up to the gate, and Boaz's brother, the Bible said that he went. Now Ruth stayed back at the house awaiting on him, you see. And he said, I'll be back to pick you up. And she said, I hope everything goes all right. And he went on up to the gate, and he sat out on the gate, and lo and behold, here come that near kinsman walking by. And he said, Hold such a one. Come here a minute. Come here a minute and sit down. I want to talk to you. And he came over there and sat down. And he told him the story. How that Ruth had came from this far country. And that she needed to be redeemed. And that he was the nearest kinsman. And if he didn't redeem him, Boaz was going to get him. But he realized that that guy had first shot. Now, you know the law came first, didn't it? The law came first. The Bible said over in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7 and verse 25, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. And so you see this morning, the law was not able to redeem it. Look at what this man said this morning over in verse 6. Look at what this man who would represent the law would say to us this morning in verse 6. And the kinsman said, this is one that would represent the commandment keeping, he said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Did you get that this morning? Here was a man that represented the law saying, I cannot redeem it. Now friends, this morning, this may be the first time you've ever realized this. But the law came by Moses, and the law was not given to save anybody. You remember when Moses went up on the mountain, and God wrote it out there with His fingers, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's his house, his wife, or anything. Brother, God was not given those to say, here, live by this and you'll get to heaven. God never gave the law to save anybody. God gave the law to show us we needed to be saved. And when you find yourself failing God's law and failing God's law and failing God's law and no matter how hard you try, you keep messing up and you can't do good to save your life and it's naturally inside of you to sin. That is showing you that the law can't save you. It was given to show you you need to be saved. The law is not our kinsman redeemer. The law is our kinsman condemner. The Bible says we're, con we're condemned by the law, brother. And if a man tries to keep the law in order to get to heaven, he's cursed. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things written in the old law. Brother, I want you to know this morning, somebody said, well, I'm a pretty good feller. I, I, I try to pay my bills. I ain't never robbed a bank. As far as I know, I don't do anything to hurt anybody. You reckon I'll go to heaven? No, you won't. 
because you don't go to heaven by keeping commandments. You go to heaven because you find somewhere and God does something for you in your heart. You find you a place of prayer somewhere and God does a work in your heart and therefore He gives you a ticket and says, here you get in on this. Kinsman, you're redeemed by this king. This first kinsman was a type of the law. He couldn't redeem it. Romans 3.20 says, Wherefore, uh, talking about the law, the law... uh, uh, serveth because you know because of transgression it was added and all of these things and the law would represent this and that's a long story that we'll not take time to go in but he said wherefore by the deeds of the law is shall no flesh be justified for the law is the knowledge of sin you got that down folks you got that down in your mind the laws of God. When you read over there and God said, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. Those things were not given to forgive you. They were given to give you knowledge that you had sinned against God. The law does not bring the knowledge of sin. I mean, the forgiveness of sin, it brings the knowledge of sin. The law never has saved anybody. It was given to show us we need to be saved. It was our kinsman condemner and not our kinsman redeemer. Galatians 3.13, thank God, says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. And I stand before you this morning on my way to heaven. You look at me up here. There's 250 of you sitting out there. Look at me right here in these two eyes. I stand here in front of you this morning on my way to a better land. And I'm on my way to a country that's fairer than day that God's provided for me. And there's probably some of you sitting there that didn't know me before I got saved said, well, it's alright for you. If that's your, if that's your thing, you can go ahead and do it. But it's not for me. I just can't do it. And you don't realize where God brought me from. And I'm not going to heaven this morning because I'm a preacher. I'm not going to heaven because I wave a Bible around or because I wear a tie. I ain't got a thing in the world to do with it. Brother, I want you to know this morning, I am going to heaven because one day God looked down and He saw that I was a sinner and He saw that I could not help myself. He saw that I didn't have nothing but sin and old corruption and stinking rotten thoughts and evil deeds in my heart. And He knowed I couldn't get out of it. And He let His only Son come down here and die on the cross and spread out His hand and say, Put them right there, boys. And they nailed Him down. And they let the blood fell down. And brother, I come to Jesus and trusted Him as my Savior. And God gave me a ticket and said, You get in on this. Amen. I ain't going to heaven with all that heart and scream. These people holler and scream at uh, devil worship and no telling what all. Communist rallies and rock concerts. I'm not going to heaven because I say you must be going, born again. I'm going to heaven this morning, thank God, not because I've kept the law, but because somebody kept the law for me and paid my way. Now, you'll never be able to enjoy being saved. You understand that right there. You ever seen anybody? Oh, I'm scared to death. I'm scared to death. I'm lost. I don't know if I'm saved or not. I'm, you know, back and forth. You'll never be able to enjoy being saved until you just say, Lord, you paid it for me on the cross. The Bible said, if I trust that I'm saved, regardless of my feelings, by God's Word, I'm saved. You will never enjoy living for God until you get that place right there. You say, well, if I can just hang on and hold out, maybe I'll make it. No, brother. You couldn't hang on you got out the door. Wouldn't I be silly when I was going to Michigan a couple of months ago? Wouldn't I look funny? Got out there in the big big old uh, jet and everybody, you know, getting on it, board and everything, and I give them my ticket and everything, and I got out there and I heard them things and wind a blowing, brother, about to blow you down. And if I'd have got out there on that and throwed my baggage up there somewhere and got a hold of that wing, wrapped my arms around it just as tight as I could, say, now if I can just hold on, they'll get me to Flint, Michigan. If I can just hang on, I'll make it. You know, that's the way a lot of people are trying to, they're trying to get a hold of the old gospel ship and just hang on. Let me tell you something, friend. Jesus paid for me a first class ticket. And you know what I do? I go in there and I'm scared, but I, I trust him flying it better than I would me myself. And I trust that pilot to get me to Flint, Michigan. Not myself, I trust the pilot. And I get in there and I give him my ticket, 
and I sit down on that plane and I say, Lord, take all, uh, take all these cusses that everybody's been cussing this plane all day. Take the dams off of it. And Lord, help us uh, to make it where we're going. And Lord, help us to get there safely. And I just trust it and leave it in the hands of the pilot and God. And brother, you can enjoy the ride to heaven if you'll quit your worrying and quit your fretting. Which way am I going? Oh, no. You go crazy like that. Amen. What you need to do is forget your feelings. Forget your worries. Forget your frets. Forget wringing your hands and taking aspirins. And just get down to business and say, God, you said it in your word. I'm going to sit down in the old gospel ship and I'm going to trust the pilot to get me to heaven. Amen. Hey, and brother, we're just sitting there in them first class seats, seats just a riding in this morning. Now, anybody that don't believe in the grace of God despise us for that. Makes them so mad they can't stand it. They say you're haughty, you're puffed up. No, we're just believing the word of God and shouting on it. I done told you I ain't going because of me being good. They'll say, now that's the wrong attitude. You're supposed to be humble. So, oh Lord, if working and praying has any reward, then surely, Lord, I'll, I'll, get, I'll make it in somehow. I'll make it to heaven somehow if I keep a working. You'll never get to heaven that way. I talked to a boy the other day, the Mormon the other day, and I left the door open. I didn't invite him in, but I left the door open. I wanted to talk to him. And... Uh, Got in there and sat down and started talking to them. And uh, uh, one of them said, I said, of course, you know how I believe. And they said, yeah. And I said, they know, I know how you believe. And they said, yeah. And they said, I said, you know, I believe you're wrong. And they said, yeah, and you know, we believe you're wrong. And I said, well, uh, let me ask you this, sir. You're out here working. You're going from door to door. You're telling people about the Lord. Uh, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? I mean right now. If I was to pull out a gun and shoot you, would you go to heaven? He said, I don't know. And I said, well, what, are you, what are you doing out here knocking on doors and telling people about a place you don't even know if you're going yourself? You ought to be getting that settled. I said, do you mean to tell me that you think there's a chance you might go to hell? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, good night, man. If I thought, if I thought any minute, knowing what I know about hell now, I used to know nothing about it, but knowing what I know now, if I thought that under me there was a burning fire, and I'd liable to get killed in a car wreck or something and slip into it and go in that fire. Brother, I'd be finding me a place and find out how to get out of it. Now, a man that don't care if he's going to hell, he's, he's somebody missing upstairs, brother. he got room for rent. I mean, a place that wants somebody that's cares. I don't care. I'm going to hell. And all my friends will be there. You ain't got good sense, friend. And I said, brother, I said, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, yeah. And I said, well, how are you going to get there? He said, well, as we comply with the wishes of our Father and do those things that please Him, gradually we feel like we'll be accepted by Him. And I said, would you believe it if I showed you in the Bible where you know you've got eternal life and know you're going to heaven right now? I said, if I showed you in the Bible, would you believe it? And he kind of thought for a minute and I said, if I showed you in the Bible now, of course they profess to believe the Bible, so he had to say yes. And I said, he said, yes, I, if, I, if you showed me in the Bible. And so I turned into 1 John 5.13 said these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have present tense not hoping to get God's favor not hoping to make it in that ye have eternal life and I said you believe that? and he said well that's how you interpret it I said how you interpret it? I didn't interpret it I just read it now, what these people, how come people are messed up in different religions? And the way they get messed up is they think that they want a salvation in which they have a part. And they want to have a part in it. So when they get up to heaven, they say, I worked pretty hard to get here. And you know, they think, well, I've made an accomplishment. And men always like to feel like he kind of made it in on his own goodness. And, brother, they just absolutely despise a group of people that believe in God's grace. 
that will say, I've messed up, I've sinned, I've come short of the glory of God, I ain't fit to live or die, but by His grace, thank God I'm going in. And brother, they can't stand that liberty and that assurance that we have. Brother, I want you to know that's the good news. That's the gospel. That's the good news that Jesus saves. If you're here this morning and your life is in trouble, Jesus saves. If you're here this morning and you can't got hang-ups and you can't give them up, Jesus saves. If you're here this morning and you're bound by sin and you can't seem to shake it and you just worry from one day to the next, and taking pills and can't go to sleep sober, let me tell you, brother, that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And He'll save you this morning if you'll live. Yes, He will. Brother, there ain't a man in this church that the Lord couldn't just leave down saved this morning. Amen. He said, I'm getting scared in here. You better not go to heaven. You better leave this house. Amen. Amen. When my feet hit the streets of gold, they won't hit again for another hour. Amen. Yes, sir. I'm riding in on my first class ticket. Amen. All right, right quickly. Amen. The Bible says, Titus 3 and 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, Amen. He saved us. Romans 8, 3 said, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sin in His own Son and likeness of uh, sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. Right. Now the Bible said the law couldn't do it. Right. There ain't never been nobody saved by doing good or being good. Right. I talk to people all the time and I say, you going to heaven? They say, well, I'm, I live a good life. I belong to a church. I was baptized. But you'll never make it. Right quick this morning, the redemption itself. Let's look at it. First of all, it was an able redemption. It was an able redemption. Boaz was able to do it. The kinsman said, I don't want nothing to do with it. I don't want that woman on me. And I, you better take her. And Boaz was able. That means he had the wealth. That means he had the power for the purchase. Now, brother, our Savior is like that too. He had the wealth, friend. He owns it all. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And the hills and the taters in the hills. And brother, he owns it all this morning. And I want you to know, thank God, that he was able to save us. Right. Now you insult God when you say something like this. I believe I've just gone too far. There ain't no hope for me. He's able to save you. Amen. Problem is, you don't want to give up your sinning. Amen. That's all. That's your problem. You're using that as an excuse to get to live like a devil. Yeah. And you know what's wrong with about 25, 30, or 40 people in this building this morning? You have let Hollywood and the people you grew up with turn your eyes and get you to having a good time on just a few little old things that's going to pass away one day. And first thing you know, you're going to look around and your good times will be gone. Your friends will be gone. Your money will be gone. The parties will be over. And brother, then you're going to have to die and face God unprepared and spend eternity in a lake of fire. Now that's a trick. That the devil's playing. It was an able redemption. He was, he was had the power. He was wealthy. And he is single, and he got her. Secondly, this morning, it was a willing redemption. It was a willing redemption. Boaz didn't have to do that. He didn't have to fool this girl. He could have just left her alone. So when you stay back where you come from, and he just said, "I'm willing." He loved her, and he paid the full price. Acts chapter twenty. Verse 28, Take heed to uh, feed the flock of God over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, which He hath purchased with His own blood. Amen. And so, brother, we were purchased just like Ruth was purchased. Amen. And thank God this morning, it was a willing redemption. Brother, he, the Bible said that Jesus loved the church and gave Himself for it in Ephesians 5 and 25. In 1 John 4 19, the Bible said we love Him because He first loved us. He gave Himself for her and to her. He loved this girl and He was willing to pay the price for this girl. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever understood the reason that Christ died on the cross. I don't know if you've ever understood why that they nailed His hands and that they nailed His feet and that they pierced His side and put a crown of thorns on His head. I don't know if you've ever understood that. But brother, I want you to understand it this morning. Listen, He done this willingly to save sinners. He done it willingly. Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. This stupid stuff they got going on, God spell and all that junk, it ain't fit for dogs. Amen. Amen. So I don't like that. Well, that shows how much you know about the Bible. Amen. Jesus Christ Superstar, they don't know what they're talking about. Amen. That's so far away from the Jesus of the Bible, brother, it couldn't even come close. Amen. And brother, I want you to know this morning, Jesus Christ wasn't a little old weak sissy going around starting up a revolution trying to get a few followers. He had more of a mission here than that. He's here for a purpose. And I want you to know, brother, His plans wasn't messed up. And they didn't murder Him. He gave His life freely. They didn't overpower Him against His own will. He said, I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it back up again. You remember back there in the garden, don't you, what happened? When they come up to get Him, He said, who do you want? Bam! Every one of them fell down. He didn't even have to touch them. He could have knocked the whole crowd out. And when he's dying on the cross, when he's up there on the cross, brother, he could have called 10,000 angels if he wanted to. And he said, get me down off this cross. But he didn't do it. It was a willing redemption. Amen. Now, God wants you to come to him that, that, way, that way this morning. He wants you to be willing until you think, well, I don't want to live for God. You won't never. You say, well, I'm not ready. Well, you probably won't be, never be ready. There's probably. 500 people in McDowell County waiting until the time they're ready. You know what I found out? I found out I had to go ahead and get saved because I never did get ready. And you won't never get ready. Now there is a sense in which God brings you under conviction and brings you to Him and all of that. I understand that. But what I'm saying, it'll never be easy for you to step out of your seat and walk down here to this aisle. It ain't never going to get easy. There ain't no such thing. There all the time it happens to you, the flesh is going to be saying, no, I don't want to go up there. I don't, I'm good enough. And the devil's going to be saying, you don't need to. People will laugh at you. People will make fun of you. What about all your friends? You'll have to quit doing this. You'll have to quit doing that. It ain't never going to be easy if you get saved. But I want you to know this morning, brother, it was a will and redemption. And he bought Ruth because he loved her. And brother, he bought and paid the price. And you say this morning, here I'm a preacher. I'm here and i got a problem. I got things in my life that's destroying me, and I know it, and my family knows it, and my brothers and sisters know it. But I need help. I just can't give them up. All you got to do is come and say, Lord, give me that ticket. And He'll write you out a ticket to go to heaven and hand it to you. If you believe it, you can go in on that ticket right there. That's all. That's all they are to it. All right, number three this morning it was a public redemption. A public redemption. Right out in public, brother. No hiding, no sneaking around. Nothing done behind a closed door. Right out where everybody could see what was going on. The Bible says that He gathered those elders around the city. He said, boys, I want you to hear what's going on here. I'm purchasing this lady to be my wife in this field. See, a, a kinsman had to redeem the person and an inheritance. There's two things involved when a person was redeemed. They had an inheritance, and they had the person themselves. And he bought this piece of ground, he bought Ruth both. But anyway, he called them all in there. It was a public redemption. Right out in front of the gate, right out in front of everybody. Now, you know what this means to me? It means that Boaz wasn't ashamed of Ruth. Amen. Brother, he was proud to be able to let everybody know who his wife was. Amen. And brother, the same thing worked with Jesus Christ. He's not ashamed to be called our Father this morning. He's, he wasn't ashamed of us. The Bible said He died on the cross. And it was out in public too. The people come by and laughed at Him and made fun of Him and mocked Him and said, Hey, if you're so tough, why don't you get down off that cross? If you're such a great man, come down here and save yourself. And brother, they humiliated Him, stripped Him naked on the cross, made fun of Him, spit on Him, beat Him with the palms of their hand. And brother, He let them know right quick that He was dying for a people. And that people was me and you. Now, it's hard for me to believe how the Lord couldn't be ashamed of us this morning, but He's proud to be called our God. 
And brother, I tell you what, we ought to be proud to call Him our Father. God help these little mousy, mousy Christians that are scared to death to pray over their blessing at work. And bless, their, bless God to bless their food. Amen. Jesus wasn't ashamed of you to die on the cross for your sin. You ashamed to bow your head and scratch your eyebrows. Well, most of them end up doing, you know, right before they get ready, they say, rrr, rrr. so nobody won't think they prayed, you know. Scared to death somebody going to see them. Brother, I want you to know, we shouldn't be ashamed of Him. He wasn't ashamed of us. Brother, I want you to know, he. you ever read Acts 26, 26? The Bible said over the book of Acts chapter 26, this thing, you know, when Paul was preaching, I believe it was Paul preaching to the group, and he said this thing was not done in a corner. It wasn't hid and snuck around something they slipped up on everybody with. It was done right out in public where everybody could see what was going on. And Brother Jesus Christ done the same way. And Boaz done the same thing. Yet we're ashamed of Him. You know when Moses smote that rock in Numbers chapter 20 and verse 11? He smote it right there in front of everybody where they could see it. It was not done. It was not hid. It was not done in a corner. And it's a pretty sorry person. You listening? I'm coming to a close now in just a moment. It's a pretty sorry person that let their friends at school shake them out of living for Jesus and let the crowd they work with keep their mouth shut about Jesus when Jesus Christ loved us enough to die on an old cross for you and them friends you supposedly got at school wouldn't give you air if you were suffocating. With friends like that, you don't need enemies. Amen. You say, I got my friends. They ain't your friends. Right. I had them kind of friends too, you know. And I found out how much of my friends they was. First time they got a chance, they stabbed me in the back. You don't need no enemies when you got friends that way. But you say, it's all I got. Better than none. I don't know about that, if it is or not. Amen. Let me tell you about a friend that sticks closer than a brother. A friend that will go with you all the way and not be ashamed of you. Brothers, stand before God one day and not be ashamed. All right, finally and forth this morning, it was a perfect redemption. I find an amazing statement made in chapter 3 by, by Naomi. You ever, you ever read this? That makes me want to shout every time I read something in the Bible like this. When I'm already imagining things and I'm going through that reading the Old Testament and i got the New Testament in my mind and I come across like, something like chapter 3 and verse 18 and brother, something goes mm, on the inside of me. Brother, look what Naomi said. Naomi told Ruth, she said, now just sit still, Ruth. Just calm down. Everything's going to be all right. Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man, meaning Boaz, will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. And brother, she said, he'll finish it. She said, I ain't never known Boaz to start something and not finish it. He'll finish it. And brother, I want you to know, Jesus will finish His work too. I don't care what science and religion education may say. I don't care what Darwin may say. I don't care what anybody says. Jesus was here a long time before that crowd got here. And He'll finish His work. He'll finish it. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now I'm glad to tell you this morning it's a perfect redemption. See, Ruth was getting worried. She said, oh no, what if something happens? What if something goes wrong? What if it, what if it don't come back? I don't know if we're going to get married or not. And now we said, just sit down. Just cool it. Ruth? He's just like Martha. You know, he's just worried, scared to death. Just hold your horses. He'll finish it. Amen. She said, where's he at? Where's he at? He's supposed to come and get me. Where's he at? He's supposed to come and get me. And I imagine Ruth went to the door 1,500 times that day. And I'm looking out the window, I'm looking for when Boaz was going to come and get her. But brother, I want you to know, when everything got fixed up and all the deeds were signed over and the price is paid, he come back and got her. And brother, that's where we're at right now. He's paid the price. He's purchased us to be our wife. And right now, we're just sitting down here at Naomi's house waiting on Boaz to come and get us. And brother, he's a coming one day too. You say, well, I've been saved five years and I've been looking for the Lord and He ain't come yet. He's a coming. Amen. You say, well, I've been saved 20 years and I've been hearing people say the Lord's coming all my life and He ain't never come. He's a coming. Amen. You say, well, I heard a guy at school say that uh, they discovered other religions and they were just as good as ours and that Jesus wasn't never going to come back. He's a coming. Amen. 
Brother, I don't care what men may say or men may do. He's coming. They may say in the last days, the sun's still rising in the east and sets in the west. He ain't never come yet. I know the sun's still rising in the east and sets in the west. But He's a coming one day. Yes, He is. He finished it. She looked and looked and looked and wondered and looked and looked and wondered and looked and wondered and looked and wondered. wondered. But one day, He finally come. And He finally came and picked her up. Brother, it may be just a few more days that me and you have to wait. I get so sick of this world. I get fed up with it up to here. I just say, Lord, sooner the better. You come on, I'm ready to go. You say, how can you say that? Because I'm sick of this world. I'm wanting to see Him come on back. I'm sick of people laughing at us. I'm sick of people saying, you Christians think you're right and everybody else is wrong. I'm sick of people saying, why, how do you know you got the true religion? I'm sick of people making fun of God on television programs and magazines and on radio. I'm sick of it. I just want the Lord just to come on and get us out of this mess. And if the Lord just wanted to come on right now, I say, Lord, that dinner and wait, we'll have one make cutting up our look sick. Amen. Amen. And brother, I ain't got no plans made this morning, but I couldn't drop just like that this morning. Amen. I wouldn't say, Lord, now let me don't I wait till next month. I gotta do this next week. But I say, forget it, let it go. Amen. I'm cold, brother. Amen. I, I'm not I'm not gonna go out here and commit suicide and kill myself. I I don't think I'm worse enough to. I'll I tell you one thing. I don't wanna stay here one second longer than he wants to be. Amen. He gets through, brother. I would rather you let go of me and I'll just get right through the city. You say, well, that sounds wild and far fetched. It ain't as wild as Star Wars. How come people believe in flying saucers, Martians, and everything else? They ain't never seen one. Don't believe the Bible. Stood the test through the ages. And thousands can stand and say, this book has changed my life. And I'm a new person. Brother, you never put your faith in the Word of God. Brother, we've got a husband that's coming back to get us one of these days. What if all of a sudden we is here looking and we said, is he coming? He didn't come in 77. He didn't come in 78. Here it is, 79. Reckon he's a coming? And we thought, well, Ruth probably sat down and says, I don't know, maybe something went wrong. He probably forgot about me and met some other girl down there and ran off with her. But about that time, somebody said, I think I see somebody coming. And he said, is that him? And she ran to the door and her heart said, boom, 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 boom. She said, is that, Ru- is that Boaz? And the closer he got, brother, she knew that it was him. Now, do you think that Ruth would have stood there in that house? Glory to God, brother. I ain't even thought about this. The Lord just putting it in. Do you think Ruth would have stood in that house and let Boaz come all the way to that house? She couldn't have stayed in that house. She went out to meet him. And brother, when we see Jesus coming, we ain't even going to wait. We're going to rise to meet him. Amen. We'll say, is that him? And brother, we can't stand the way till he gets down here. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort yourselves together with these words. He's our Redeemer, brother. Our kinsman Redeemer. And Ruth ran and put the veil over her face and all that stuff, and they went off and lived happily ever after. And oh, they got down there and the man plucked off his shoe, you know. That was a custom in those days. If you made an agreement with somebody, you took your shoe off and gave it to them. And if you went around with somebody's shoe, you'd know that they made some kind of agreement or something. And he had it settled. It was finished. There's no way that other man could ever get her. And they rode off into the sunset to live happily ever after. Isn't that a wonderful story? Oh, glory to God, brother. We could never get through with it. I tell you what, that would make any preacher want to preach thinking about the glories of God. And I tell you, they, there's a lot in here that ain't never been brought out sin. Or yet. And probably we'll preach it and preach it and preach it and never will get it all out. But let me tell you, I want to go down on record this morning and saying I believe what the book says. And I tell you what, in the face of communism, fascism, wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilences and computers and everything else, that are just leading up to the coming of the Lord, I want to go down on record as warning you 250 people this morning to be ready for in such an hour as you think not, 
He's coming. I hope you're ready to go. If you're not ready to meet Jesus right now, this morning, wouldn't you like to just come and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to live for you. I want to be able to have that, what man he's got, that he was preaching about this morning. And I want to be able to lay down on my pillar at night and just say, Lord, if you come tonight, I'm ready to go. Lord, if I get killed on the way home, I'm ready to go. Would you like to have that? You say, yes, well, you can have it. Come and believe that Jesus died for you. Take Him as your Savior, and God will save your soul. Let us stand with our heads bowed.